All right, here we are, the uh, lesson number uh, 13, I believe the final one in this series, Elders, Deacons, Preachers, and Saints, and today's lesson is entitled, Who Are the Saints? Who Are the Saints? So we've uh, reviewed the role and the qualifications of each of these uh, individuals in the last couple of months, elders, looked at deacons, preachers, so on and so forth, looked at some controversial issues, you know, the role of women in ministry and so on and so forth. Um, I've, um, I've put the term saints last, not because of importance, but rather because uh, it's a generic term that refers to all Christians, whereas elders or preachers or deacons describe specific people who have particular roles in the church. Uh, uh, everyone in the church is a saint, but not everyone in the church serves as an elder or a deacon or, or, or a preacher. So today I want to take a, a step back and see what the qualifications and responsibilities are of those who would call themselves saints. Now, like the other rules that we've been talking, or roles rather, that we've been talking about, the word helps define what a saint is. Is. In other words, if you understand what the word means, well, you then understand you know, the person who wears that word, um, who that person is. Now, when I was a child, of course, you, you know, I grew up uh, in a Catholic household. You know, if, you, if you grew up in French Quebec and your dad was Italian, there was a 99.9% .9 chance that you'd be Roman Catholic you know, in the province of Quebec. And I grew up Catholic. And um, I remember as a child, I used to think that a saint was an extremely religious clergyman or a person who could do miracles or a person through whom miracles were done. In other words, somebody prayed to a really holy person about something or other and, and, and a miraculous sign took place because of that, that prayer. Um, a good example of this in my uh, upbringing was uh, Brother Andre uh, in Quebec. Now in Quebec, everybody knows who this is. This person might be new to you, but in Quebec, everyone knew who Brother Andre was. He was a kind of a deacon, if you wish, in the Ro Roman Catholic Church back in the 20s, 1920s. And um, uh, the brothers, the order of brothers, were not priests. They, they, couldn't, you know, they couldn't say mass or hear confession. They couldn't administer what's called the sacraments. Uh, so they, they were like deacons. You know, they worked uh, mainly as teachers. Uh, you know, they, were, they were the correspondence to nuns. You had nuns and you had brothers. I remember growing up, again in Catholic Quebec, going to Catholic school, the nuns were teaching the girls and the brothers were teaching the boys. Uh, they were clerics in the sense that they all lived in community, in one house, they didn't marry, you know, they took vows of poverty and so on and so forth. So that's, that's Brother Andre. And uh, his particular job, he wasn't, he wasn't a teacher, he was a doorkeeper at the seminary for boys in Montreal. In other words, he checked kids in and out, you know what I'm saying? That was his job. He was a, a, a doorkeeper for a large uh, uh, seminary where thousands of young Catholic boys uh, went. Um, he was uh, apparently a very kind and a very devout man, well known in the Roman Catholic circles at the time. After his death, people claimed healings when they prayed on his name. And as a result, a huge cathedral and shrine was built there in Montreal. And if anyone of you ever visited, many of you have visited in Montreal, but if ever you go there, you see what's called St. Joseph's Oratory. It was called St. Joseph because Brother Andre's favorite saint was St. Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus. And so through uh, you know, his popularity, through the miracles that people claimed were attributed uh, to prayers to Brother Andre after he died, uh, 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 the, the Catholic Church built this huge cathedral right on the mountain, near, near the top of the mountain, uh, uh, Mount Royal, uh, in Montreal. And it's so huge, I mean, you, you can be 10, 15 miles away 
driving on the highway towards Montreal and you can see it uh, you know, uh, in the panorama of the, uh, of the city. So each year hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people visit St. Joseph's Oratory and they visit his tomb. As a matter of fact, one of the highlights when you visit there is there's a, um, a special room, if you wish, and there's a box there and inside that box, the specially hermetically seen, sealed box, there is Brother Andre's heart. And yes, I heard the shriek there. <laughs> Brother Andre's heart is there. And people come by and they look at that and they've got a replica of the room where he lived. It's like a museum to, um, to uh, Brother uh, Andre. And they talk about the miracles that happened during his time. Now, uh, Brother Andre was canonized, meaning he was officially made into a saint in 2010. So he used to be Brother Andre, but now he's Saint Andre. Okay? So Brother Andre really represents what I, growing up as a Catholic boy in Quebec, understood a saint to be. A very, very holy person who had miracles attributed to him during his life or after his death. Um, if we live long enough, uh, we'll probably see the same thing happen to someone who's more familiar to Americans, and that's uh, Mother Teresa. Uh, she will be declared a saint. For the moment, she's referred to as Blessed Mother Teresa, and blessedness is a category uh, one step lower than sainthood. There's always a very long investigation and you know, examination of the miracles and so on and so forth. And while they're doing that, you know, it's step by step. So uh, the step before you become a saint in Catholic theology is called uh, blessedness. Uh, apparently a person needs two miracles credited to them in order to be canonized as a saint. And Mother Teresa apparently has only one miracle uh, 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 credited accredited to her or prayers through her uh, so far, and uh, later on uh, they, will, uh, they will canonize her as a saint. So anyways, I'm just, I'm just showing you this because for the longest time this is what I thought a saint was. And I think most of the world thinks this as well. People say, oh, that, that woman was a saint. You know, that man, oh, he was a saint. You know, they're thinking, a person of such high moral standards, a person so giving, a person, you know, just a perfect person almost. That, that person uh, is a saint. But if we look at the Bible, however, we see that the word saint means something, well, not completely different, but certainly different in, in context. In the Old Testament, the word uh, translated into the English word saint referred to something that was pronounced clean ceremoniously or morally. In other words, it was pronounced. This thing, this person, this place is pronounced as being holy. In other words, it was the word used to refer to the thing, whether it was a sacrifice or a place, whether it was the sanctuary, or a person, the word saint. It was the word used in Hebrew to determine that thing, person, place as being clean or as being pure. So something was impure, a place, a person, a thing, right? And meaning, when I say impure, I don't mean it was immoral, dirty, it just, it was common, it was human. All right. So something was impure and then because of some pronouncement or action by God, not, a, not man, but by God, that thing or that person or that place was made pure. And when it became pure through God's action, this is the word that was used to refer to it. The word that we translate into the English word holy or saint. So that's the kind of a quick history, an abbreviated history of this particular word in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we know um, that the New Testament was uh, written in Greek, 
So the word translated saint in the Greek means, well, the same thing. Someone who is holy and pure uh, or morally upright. Now in the New Testament, it's usually used in the plural form and it always refers to believers or those who were members of the church. I repeat, in the plural form, always used, I, I always used to refer to people in the church. For example, in Romans chapter 15, 26, it says, Macedon, or Paul says, uh, for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Well, who were the saints in Jerusalem? Well, they were the church. And you could take the word saint out and put the word church in and you'd have exactly the very same meaning. Another example of this word, I'm not going to give you 15 or 20, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth and he says, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified Sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Again, used in the plural form, used to refer to the people who were in the church, not specific people. You know, sometimes he would say to the elders. Oh, okay, those were specific people. Or to, uh, or to the preacher, he'd be writing to Timothy, you know, the evangelist. That was a specific person, okay. Or deacons, those were specific people in the church. But when he refers to the entire church, he uses either the word uh, church, many times he uses the term those who are called, Okay, that's another term. And sometimes he uses the term saints, all interchangeable. The saints were everybody in the church, not the most mature, not the godliest, not the ones who did the most work, not the holiest, not the oldest, everybody. From the individual who had just come up out of the water of baptism to the person who had served as an elder in a particular church for 50 years. Everybody, if they were in Christ, in the church, they were saints, okay? Now, according to the scripture, that's not the definition we get, you know, the popular definition, uh, mostly used by uh, the Catholic church. So in this passage here in particular, Paul says four things, but he's referring to the same people. You know, it's like when you say your dad is your mom's only husband, he's also the father of your brother, he's the brother of your uncle, and he's the coach of the soccer team. You've said four things, but you've, 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 you've referred to the very same person. Okay? Well, that's what's going on here. He uses different terms referring to exactly the same group. He talks to these men and women in Corinth and uh, he refers to them in four different ways. And these things, these four different ways, tells us a lot about saints. All right? First of all, they were the church of God at Corinth. The word church means the called out. It was actually a political term at one time, referring to those who were called out to be the elders of a city or the leaders of a tribe. Those were the called out. The city fathers who sat at the gate of the city, they were the called out. They were the ecclesia, no particular religious connotation. But Jesus takes this term to refer to His followers as a group. Okay? So they were the called out by God, called out of the world by the gospel and into the body of Christ through repentance and baptism. So the first thing that Paul says about this group, these saints if you wish, is they're the church. They're the called out. The second thing he says is they were sanctified 
in Christ Jesus. Now the word sanctify means to make something holy or to purify something. It's the, it's the action of taking something and purifying it in some way. So Jesus is the one who sanctifies or purifies His disciples. It's through Him that they go from being impure and unacceptable to being pure and holy and clean. You, know, you, 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 you confess Christ, you repent of your sins and you go into the waters of baptism how? Well, you're guilty as a sinner, therefore you're unclean, you're, you're damnable, if you wish. You're impure by all your, the guilt of all your sins, a lifetime of sin. And you go into the water, and you come out of the water, how? You come out of the water pure, sanctified. Well, is there any magic in the water? Is there something you know, in the particular water? that? No, of course not. What's happening is that in obeying Christ, through faith, in the waters of baptism, He's the one that purifies you. He's the one that cleanses away our sins through His blood. He's the one that pronounces us clean, pure, saintly. He's the one who does it. Why? Oh, because we have obeyed Him in faith. We've responded to His call to us through the gospel by obeying the call that He makes. Okay. So we are sanctified. The church is sanctified through, through, Jesus, uh, through Jesus Christ. Paul says that. Then he says another thing. He says, they are saints. They were saints by calling. Saints refers to their condition now, that they have been washed and that they have been purified. They didn't do this on their own, they didn't do this by their own strength or goodness. They didn't go around, you know like the 12-step program? They have a 12-step program. I'm not criticizing that, but it's a common thing in the 12-step program for uh, alcoholics or sex, uh, uh, sex uh, 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 those who are addicted to pornography, uh, whatever. You know, wh whatever addiction you have, there's a 12-step there's a program. And part of the 12-step program is going back and trying to, you know, make right many of the wrong. You, know, you insulted somebody, you hurt somebody, you, know, you have to go to your children or your spouse and, and kind of make things right. You know? Well, uh, Christianity, that's okay for the 12-step program, but Christianity isn't like that. You know, we're not, we don't become saints by going back and fixing all of the stuff that we've done wrong in our past life. Some people think that that's what repentance is. Repentance is supposed to be going back and fixing all the things that you messed up in your past life. Really? Because if that's what repentance is, there's a lot of people that are not going to get to heaven. Why, you say? Well, how do you fix an abortion? How do you fix that? How do you make that one right? Whether you're the woman who has it or you're the man who's encouraged the woman to have it. I mean, I picked that because it's such a glaring thing. Or maybe, uh, you're, uh, you are an alcoholic and for 20 years you, know, you made your children miserable and your wife miserable or vice versa, made your husband miserable. Right? How, do you, how do you fix that? How do you go back and make that right? You, you, there's no way to make that right. You can say you're sorry, but it doesn't fix it. You know, I, I would hope we understand that the, the, it's the cross of Jesus that fixes everything. It's the cross of Jesus that makes restitution for all the dumb, stupid, bad, vile, mean, foolish things that we've ever done. It's the cross that makes restitution for that. Repentance is, I know what I've done wrong. And from here on in, I'm going to make it my life to not do that anymore. If I had a, a, an abortion, this is not the way I'm going to deal with a pregnancy that I may not want in the future. If I was addicted to whatever, I'm taking steps to walk away from that, and so on and so forth. So they were saints, not because they went back and fixed everything in their past lives, they were saints because they 
responded to the call of Jesus. Jesus said, come to me, those who are, are weary and heavy laden. Well, what are they weary and heavy laden with? Uh, sin. <laughs> sin, guilt, fear, dread, disgust with themselves. That's the burden. And what do we learn from him? We learn that he makes restitution for all of that on the cross. And in responding to him in faith, in other words, believing that his cross makes restitution for all our sins and demonstrating that faith through repentance and through baptism, we are cleansed, we become holy, we become pure. All the restitution for everything we've ever done in the past and in the future has, has been paid up. That's how we become saints. The day that Jesus washed away their sins in baptism, they became saints, purified, cleansed, sanctified forever, forever and ever and ever. So they were saints by calling. And then the fourth thing he says in that passage is, they were united by faith in Christ. Every person called out by the gospel, then washed clean in the waters of baptism, that person is a saint. And that person is also a member of the church. And that person is also part of the worldwide body of believers who call upon Jesus for salvation. You know, we have differences of opinion with people, you know, other, other believers. The believer who believes in Christ and responds to Him in repentance and baptism, that, that, that person is my brother. Maybe that person thinks it's okay to clap in church or something, yeah, whatever. You know, we can talk about those things. We can, we can kind of get to a point of understanding about those things. But you and I are joined to every other believer who has repented, confessed Christ as the Son of God, washed clean in the waters of baptism. That's the beginning point. That's where we begin to be saints and begin the unity. So saints are not holy hermits who do miracles. And I'm not denigrating men or women, oh, like Mother Teresa, for example, who spent a lifetime of service in India you know, with the poor and the... I'm not denigrating her service, her service because of faith. I'm just saying she is not the model, the biblical model for what is a saint. She may be a biblical model for someone who's devoted, or humble, you know, or caring, but the biblical model for what is a saint is described here in, in 1 Corinthians. So saints are not holy hermits who do miracles. The term refers to any person who has been washed clean of their sins in baptism and consequently belongs to Christ's church. Okay. So elders, deacons, preachers, we said and we've discussed, these folks have certain roles within the church and the Bible makes special provision for women and their role in ministry. However, every saint has a particular role to play in the church regardless of their age or education or talent or level of maturity. There are two main responsibilities that every saint has two. Uh, you know, I'd like to add 10 more to get more volunteers you know, to clean the building or do something, but really all saints have two main responsibilities. Number one, all saints are to be faithful. So then my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now how much more in my absence work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Jesus tells the saints, I think there's a, a, a revelation, excuse me, I've read this passage a little too quickly here. It's the passage in 
uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, where Jesus tells the saints at Smyrna that if they are faithful until death, they will receive the crown of life. There's the first passage there, Revelation 2.10. We didn't put it on the, uh, on the screen. Being faithful for a lifetime requires effort. You know, someone says, what are my responsibilities in the church? And I say, you have the responsibility to make the effort to be faithful. And being faithful for a lifetime requires effort. I mean, learning and obeying the word, that's part of remaining faithful. Resisting temptation over and over again and trying once again even after we fail, that's part of remaining faithful. Faithful to the church in worship and in service, that's part of remaining faithful. Faithful in our complete trust that God can and will save us even when we are completely discouraged. That, I find that the hardest thing of all. I mean, there are sometimes, I don't know about you, but there are sometimes I look in the mirror and I'm saying, how are you ever going to make it? <laughs> Man, alive. You know, you've been working on X thing there for you know, 10 years and you still you barely have it, you, know, you barely have a grip on it. Remaining faithful is also hanging in there when even you no longer believe in yourself. Remaining faithful despite the doubts that you may have. You know, it's easy to be faithful when you're in a good mood. <laughs> when things are you know, snapping along, things are going at work, Things are going great at work, the kids are doing okay. You know, it's, it's, all, it's all good, you know. Yeah, praise the Lord, thank you, you know. It's not so easy after you've made a bad decision or given in to a, an impulse, whatever, that is turning out backwards. Uh, when you're depressed, when you're tired, when you're, oh, you feel your life's work isn't worth a, a hill of beans, you know, then it becomes difficult and challenging to remain faithful. We may not be elders, all of us, or deacons, all of us, or preachers, all of us, but as saints, we are responsible, and here's the passage here, to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. Everybody's responsible for that. And I hope we understand, you know, why do we have Bible school on Sunday morning, wouldn't it be easier? You know, some churches, they don't bother adding classrooms and all that stuff. They've got the main service, one at 10, one at 11, or one at an early and a late. You come in, you have a one hour service, you're in, you're out, you're good, you're off. You can go do your gardening or go to you know, the restaurant or whatever. Why do we insist on having Bible classes? And, and not just the same old, same old, but different ones, four different quarters, and recruiting teachers. Now, why do we do that? Because we understand that in order to remain faithful, the body has to be fed. It has to be fed the word of God, a regular diet. Why bother Wednesday? I mean, you know, the heat, the air, finding teachers, the electricity, you know, all the stuff to put on a Wednesday night service, why? Wouldn't it just be easier? You know, once a week, why do we do it? Because we understand that it's hard to be in the world, to be immersed in, in an unbelieving world many times. The, the Wednesday night service becomes almost like an oasis of faith, a refreshment from the, from the world somehow. That's why we do it. That's why it's important. All the saints are to be faithful until the end. That's one task. And then the second task, all the saints have, all the saints are to be holy. Peter says that, or says that God says that. You're to be holy because I am holy, right? Holy means separate or different or dedicated. You know, you buy a wedding dress and it is a holy thing because this particular dress has been set aside for a particular day and a particular purpose. You don't wear your wedding dress to go to Walmart to pick up a dozen eggs, right? 
Well, in the same way, saints are holy. They're set aside by God for a particular day and a particular purpose. The purpose is to glorify and honor God. The purpose of a Christian's life is to live in such a way that his life or her life brings honor to God. You're not sure about what you're doing? Ask yourself, is this in some way bringing honor to God? You're not sure about what you're watching or listening to or reading or looking at? Ask yourself, does this in some even small way bring honor to God? Believe me, that litmus test will guide you in all of your actions and all of your, all of your thoughts. And why do I say that? Because that's, that's our role as saints. We're striving to be holy. What is done, what is said, what is thought, what is accomplished, what is tried, in some way brings honor to the Father. The day saints have been set aside for is the day when Jesus returns. On that day, the great wedding between Christ and His church will take place. Excuse me. <coughs> Lots of imagery in the Bible about the church being the bride of, the bride of Christ. You know, the greatest honor saints bring to God is that they will honor and receive Christ on the day He returns. When Jesus returns, will He find us faithful and will He find us pure? He's not looking for a big church, dynamic church, He's not looking for a cutting edge church. He's looking for faithful saints and saints who live holy lives. That's what he's looking for. You know, when he came the first time, he was rejected and crucified by his own people. When he comes a second time, the point is his people will be ready and joyful for his coming. You see the symmetry there? He is preparing a people who will be ready and rejoice when He comes, because it didn't happen the first time. He got those people ready for a couple of thousand years. And when He finally arrived, what they do? They mocked Him, rejected Him, beat Him, spit in His face, crucified Him. And then, and then they persecuted His followers for another couple of thousand years. So the next time He comes, will His people be ready for Him? That's what the church is there for, to prepare us for that day. You know, in a practical sense, holiness often requires us to kind of go against the grain in this life, and that becomes hard work. Honoring God through regular worship, you know, a couple of two, three times a week, it goes against the grain of our leisure activities, overtime, inconvenient. Hey, nobody ever said it was easy to come to church. Honoring God through purity goes against the grain of bad language and sexually explicit movies and books and the temptation to being involved sexually outside of marriage. I mean, hey, you know, the, the, a movie about Jesus you know, will make 20, 30 million bucks you know, at the box office and the, and the producers will be happy. Uh, 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 what is it? Gray, I was going to say Grey's Anatomy, but that's not it. It's uh, Shades of Grey, you know, this, this, this kind of light porn. This movie makes $500 million. <laughs> and you ask yourself, are you in, the, are you in a world that is uh, encouraging you to be holy? Absolutely not. Because the world celebrates what is unholy, what is rebellious. Honoring God through giving goes against the grain of materialism and selfishness and worldliness and laziness. We want our money for us. We don't want it for God. We want to, we want to keep our money. We want to make sure that whatever we give Him will not interfere with how we live. So I go back to my example. The value of the wedding dress is not only its design and its cloth, but the fact that all of this effort and expense has been exclusively devoted to one single wearing on one single day. And I understand guys don't get that. What do you mean you spent 1200 bucks on a dress? Couldn't you just wear your, wear your sister's dress? You know? Guys don't get that. 
You know, that dress is, a, is representative of how holy and special that day is. I, I, I'll never again, unless I'm a very rich person, I'll never again spend this much money and this much time on a single dress to wear it only one time and then for it to be put away. <laughs> Guys don't get that. But it's the same thing with us. What makes the life of a saint holy is that he or she has only one life to live and it is exclusively devoted to God in preparation for that day when Jesus comes. That's the hard part about holy living. If we had two or three lives to live, we could try different lifestyles and see and compare and say, oh yeah, sure, I, I got three or four different lifestyles and oh yeah, God was right, the holy lifestyle really is the best in the end. We only get one life. Okay. So most people you know, in our society define themselves by what they do. I'm an accountant, or I'm in the military, or I'm a homemaker. Who they are is defined by what they do. As Christians, we approach this issue in the opposite way. What we do is defined by who we are. We are saints, and that influences everything we do. So as we wrap up this lesson and we wrap up this series, I'll leave you with two questions. Question number one, you know, uh, hang on a minute, there we go. Are we saints? If you're sitting in this auditorium, are you? <laughs> sitting in the church building is not what makes you a saint. It makes you, you've attended a service and that's a good thing, but it, you know, it, doesn't, it isn't what makes you a saint. You cannot become a saint by performing miracles or doing good or going to church. You can only become a saint by being washed clean of sin in the waters of Jesus' baptism. That's the only way to become a saint. And then number two, ask the question, are we acting and are we living like saints? If someone was examining your life, would they say that faithfulness and holiness were the main qualities of your life? When Jesus comes for His saints, this is what he will be looking for in order to identify them. Okay, so that's our last lesson in the series. For all those that kind of hung in there for the 13 weeks, thank you for your attention and your participation. And that's the end of the series. God bless you.